Hello and welcome back Discovery Learners to another episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. It is I, Teacher Liz here, your host once more on today, Thursday. On this episode, we're going to go over some observances, interesting history, I'll be showing you some cool landmarks, animals, pretty plants, and of course, some interesting facts. So let's not delay any further, let's start the show. And now for our daily observances. Today's first observance is National Chocolate Covered Nut Day. National Chocolate Covered Nut Day on February 25th recognizes the delicious crunchy snack drizzled in covered dunked or smothered in chocolate. The possibilities are endless with so many different types of nuts and so many different chocolate combinations. For a thousand years, nuts have been the staple of human diet. The walnut was a favorite of ancient Greeks and Romans, while Native Americans favored pecans. Both chocolate and nuts can be good for you. Dark chocolate seems to possess a substantial amount of antioxidants. While nuts can contain part of essential fatty acids, including monounsaturated fats, nuts also provide arginine, a substance that may help the walls of arteries more flexible and less prone to blockage. Many nuts are good sources of vitamin E and B2 and are very rich in protein. The first chocolate-covered peanut candy was Goober's, originally sold in 1925. The word goober was a common slang word for peanut. I never knew that before, and now I do. One of the more recognized chocolate-covered nuts is the M&M. These chocolate-covered peanuts, or chocolate-covered almonds, have become a favorite to many. The peanut M&M was introduced in 1954. They were tan until 1960 when the colors red, yellow, and green were added to production. I remembered when they added the blue M&M. How can we observe chocolate-covered nut day? Well, whether it be unsweetened chocolate, dark chocolate, white chocolate, semi-sweet chocolate, combine it with any kind of nut may be your favorite. Cashews, peanuts, but try something new to help celebrate National Covered Nut Day. Let us know in the comment section below which one you're gonna try. Our next observance is National Clam Chowder Day. Each year on February 25th, people across the nation have a bowl and a spoon ready to be filled with clam chowder as they prepare to participate in National Clam Chowder Day. A clam chowder is the simplest form of soup or stew that contains clam or fish. The most common type of clam chowder includes milk or cream as well as potatoes, though Manhattan clam chowder has tomatoes. The origin of the word chowder is up for a little bit of debate. The French word for cauldron is chaudre. The English word chowder means fish peddler. Both are on the hook for possibly the origins of chowder. In chowder, along with clams, it is common to find diced potatoes, onions, pork, or pan drippings, and of course celery. The following is a list of basic clam chowder variants. New England clam chowder, Manhattan clam chowder, Rhode Island clam chowder, Delaware clam chowder, New Jersey clam chowder, and Long Island clam chowder. I'm sure there's more. There's way more than I even thought there was. I only know of two. How can you observe National Clam Chowder Day? You can make your area's most common clam chowder. Mine is just basic New England clam chowder. But I've always wanted to try a, a bowl of Manhattan clam chowder. I love tomatoes. What kind of clam chowder are you going to try? Is it going to be your favorite or a new one? Let us know in the comment section below. For our next observance, we're going to celebrate National Toast Day. You wouldn't even believe that this is a real thing, but there is a day to celebrate toast. Thursday, February 25th is National Toast Day. Toast is very versatile. You can put jams, jellies, marmalades, butter, compotes, but why stop there? You can have chip beef and gravy. All kinds of things go great with toast, most commonly with breakfast. What makes toast so fun is going to be any kind of bread. If you like cinnamon raisin bread, you can have cinnamon raisin toast. I like sourdough bread, which means I love sourdough toast. How can we observe National Toast Day? Why not take a page out of Elwood Blues' book and have a piece of dry white toast? Not very exciting, but I love the movies, so let's give it a shot. What kind of toast are you going to try? Cinnamon raisin? Sourdough? Let us know in the comment section below, Discovery Learners. And our last observance is National Chili Day. Chili is most commonly made up of tomatoes, beans, chili peppers, meat, garlic, onions, and cumin. Cooks offer up so many different variants of the basic chili recipe, 
and with so many varieties, chili cook-off competitions love to feature chili as a favorite entry. American frontier settlers used a chili recipe of dried beef, suet, dried chili peppers, and salt. All this was wrapped together and formed into bricks that they dried. They could carry the bricks and boil them later in a pot on the trails. That's really interesting. Brings new meaning to chili on the go. At the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893, the San Antonio Chili Stand held the people from all over the United States appreciate the taste of chili. Because San Antonio was a significant tourist destination, it helped Texas-style chili con carne spread throughout the Southwest. Before World War II, hundreds of small family-run chili parlors, known as chili joints, popped up throughout the state of Texas, as well as other places in the United States. Each chili parlor claims some kind of secret recipe. I know my family has a secret recipe. How can we observe National Chili Day? Well, we can stay home and whip up our own special brand of chili. Or go get your favorite canned chili from your local supermarket or order out at your favorite restaurant that serves your favorite bowl of chili. What kind of chili do you like? I like Fritos on top of mine. How about you, Discovery Learners? Let us know in the comment section below. On this day in history. Today, in 1957, Buddy Holly and the Crickets record That'll Be The Day. That'll Be The Day is a song written by Buddy Holly and Jerry Allison. It was first recorded by Buddy Holly in the Three Tunes in 1956 and was re-recorded in 1957 by Holly and his new band, The Crickets. The 1957 recording achieved widespread success. Holly's producer, Norman Petty, was credited as a co-writer, although he did not contribute to the composition. Many other versions have been recorded. It was the first song recorded as demonstration disc by Quarrymen, a scuffle group of Liverpool that evolved into the Beatles. The 1957 recording was certified gold for over 1 million US sales by the Recording Industry Association of America in 1969. It was inducted to the Grammy Hall of Fame in 1998. It was placed on the National Recording Registry, a list of sound recordings that are culturally, historically, and aesthetically important and or inform a reflected life in the United States. In the year 2005, the second recording of the song was made on February 25, 1957 seven months after the first, at Norman Petty Studios in Clovis, New Mexico, and issued by Brunswick Records on May 27, 1957. This version was the debut album by the Crickets, The Chirping Crickets, issued November 27, 1957. The recording was made with everyone performing without additional overdubs. Brunswick recording of That'll Be The Day is considered a classic of rock and roll. It was ranked number 39 on Rolling Stone's list of 500 greatest songs of all time. Wow, that's pretty interesting. This is practically one of my favorite Buddy Holly songs. Do you like Buddy Holly? What's your favorite song? Go ahead and let us know in the comment section below. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure born today is George Harrison. Born February 25th, 1943 in Liverpool, England. This English multi-instrumentalist, singer, and songwriter best known for his time with the Beatles, with whom he wrote well-known hits such as Here Comes the Sun, Something, and While My Guitar Gently Weeps. He later founded the platinum-selling supergroup, The Traveling Wilburys, and had a successful solo career, highlighted by the 1970s triple album, All Things Must Pass. Before he was famous, he auditioned to join Paul McCartney and John Lennon's band in March 1958, performing the song, Guitar Boogie Shuffle, by Arthur Smith for his audition. McCarthy initially deemed him too young at just 15 years old, but Harrison eventually won him over. He unfortunately passed away November 29, 2001 at the age of 58. But he will always and most definitely be remembered for being one of the prestigious members of the Beatles. Happy birthday, George! Our next notable figure born today is T. Leone. Born February 25, 1966 in New York City, New York. 
This successful American movie actress who played roles in The Family Man, Deep Impact, and Bad Boys. In 2011, she played Aging Claire in Tower Heist. Before she was famous, she actually dropped out of Sarah Lawrence College and pursued acting. She also had roles in very popular movies such as Jurassic Park 3 and Spanglish. She turns 55 years old today. Happy birthday, T! Another notable figure born today is Sean Austin. Born February 25, 1971 in Santa Monica, California. This American actor is well known for his portrayal as Samwise Gamgee in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He also played Mikey Walsh in The Goonies and played the titular character Rudy in the movie sharing the same name. He also had a reoccurring role in season 2 of Stranger Things and on Netflix too, the show No Good Nick. Before he was famous, he landed the role in The Goonies, then eventually graduated from UCLA with a degree in history. He turned 50 years old today. Wow! Happy birthday, Sean! And our last notable figure born today is Rashida Jones. Born February 25th, 1976 in Los Angeles, California. This American TV actress is the daughter of famous music producer Quincy Jones. She also had recurring roles in the comedic television shows The Office and Parks and Recreation. She also had roles in films such as The Social Network, The Muppets, and I Love You Man. Before she was famous, she attended Harvard University and graduated in 1997. She originally wanted to become a lawyer, but chose acting instead. She turns 45 years old today. Wow! Happy birthday, Rashida! Happy birthday, everyone! Come along, Discovery Learners, and we will see the landmarks of the world. As we continue our journey of discovery throughout Kosovo, here are some landmarks you should see. Now, Kosovo is the newest born country in Europe. It is a beautiful country with great landscapes. It has a lot to offer, from ancient to modern intertwined. And Kosovo happens to be a very small country with lots of landmarks to see. So here are some of Kosovo's most famous landmarks starting with the Museum of Kosovo. The Kosovo Museum is a nice place with modern and old things. It has an exhibition of guns from the war. In the museum, you can find documents from Declaration of Independence. Also, there is a Department of Archaeology and Natural Science. Oh wow, pretty neat! Definitely a place to visit if you want to learn more about Kosovo. Next up is Mother Teresa's Cathedral. This cathedral is a nice Roman Catholic church to honor Mother Teresa. It is a unique place that is worth a visit if you are in Kosovo. In its interior are glass stained windows with iconostasis and each of them tells a story. You can even climb up the tower, a must for spectacular views. In this Muslim country, this is actually the largest church. Up next we have Kosovo's Newborn Monument. The Newborn Monument is a very important and famous landmark in Kosovo. It is a symbol of pride. Unveiled when the country declared its independence, a beautiful and interesting monument that shows the spirit of Kosovo. It symbolizes the changing of times when Kosovo became the newest born country in Europe. A real attraction that gives you a good feeling. The vibe of the city is presented through it. People paint it differently almost every year to celebrate another year of freedom. Wow, pretty cool and artistic. This landmark is located in Pristina, Kosovo's capital. Next up on our list is the Bear Sanctuary of Pristina. The Bear Sanctuary is an amazing place where you can see actual bears doing bear things. And the bears there are rescued from places where they keep the bears in cages, usually to entertain humans. That's right. Typical places like that are zoos and circuses. The bears are in the forest and they are not aggressive because they are familiar with human contact. It is a must-see if you ever visit Kosovo and Pristina. This place is described as being peaceful with fresh air and everything there seems perfect for the bears. 
Animal sanctuaries are important places. I'm glad they have something like this for bears. The next landmark I'll be covering is actually a really cool looking building, in my opinion actually, is the National Library of Kosovo. An important landmark of a nation is the library. One of the most important and the most famous landmarks in Kosovo is the National Library. This library has a very distinctive architecture. Many see it as very pretty. The steel cage that covers it makes it very interesting. However, it looks almost brutal to many in a good way. It's worth seeing with a complex, funky, and artistic architecture that attracts many. And lastly, we have the Skanderbeg statue. Another of the most famous landmarks of Kosovo is the Skanderbeg statue. Skanderbeg is a hero that united everyone in the war against the Ottomans. It is an impressive statue and very large, too. Skandenberg is a military commander and a nobleman who was born in Albania. The square where it's located is also named after him. It is actually the second Skanderberg statue in the Balkans. Like I said earlier, and you may have heard in other ability to learn videos containing information about Kosovo, Kosovo is a new country. It claimed its independence in 1999, but it was part of other countries located in the Balkans. That area of Europe is very old. There are lots to see here in Kosovo, and I've only mentioned just the most famous landmarks. But be sure to tune in tomorrow as we recap all we learned about Kosovo here on Ability to Learn. Here's the animal of the day. Hey Discovery Learners, today's animal is the possum. Possums are medium-sized animals with a pouch. They're the only marsupials that live in North America and Canada. They also live in Australia. Those possums prefer woodland areas near streams, rivers, marshes. Other than that, they're often found near residential areas, farms, and backyards. There are 60 different types of possums. Possums are usually 15 to 20 inches long and weigh between 4 to 12 pounds. That's a big gap. Chubby little guys. Based on fossil records, possums are very old animals and one of the oldest types of mammals. They were present on Earth at the same time when the dinosaurs lived. Their bodies are covered with white grayish fur. In rare occasions, they can be black, brown, or albino. Their long tails help them with climbing. They can hang from a branch using their tail, like Eddie and Crash in the Ice Age movie. Possums have more teeth than any other mammal. They have 50 teeth in that little mouth. They are omnivorous, which means they like plants and animals, usually insects. But they also like to eat reptiles, amphibians, eggs, fruit, and berries. They often dig in trash cans to find food. Because they're omnivorous, a trash can makes a perfect restaurant for them. The main predator of possums are dogs, foxes, coyotes, hawks, and owls. Sadly, a lot of the times, it also is cars. Possums can also survive bites from poisonous snakes. They are immune to rabies and have better immune system than most mammals, meaning they don't get sick very often. Surprisingly, possums aren't very territorial. They move constantly and search for food on different locations. Possums don't dig holes and usually abandon their dens or shelters. Possums are nocturnal, which means they hunt at night. They have poor hearing and eyesight, so they rely on their other senses like sense of smell to hunt. Luckily, their sense of smell is excellent. And did you know a group of possums are called a passel? They have sharp claws that can be used against predators, but they have another more efficient technique that can help them survive. Rather than fight them, most of them curl up and pretend to be dead. They have little glands that secrete a smell, which makes other animals think they're dead, which brings the term playing possum. After mating, it only takes 14 days for the possum to be born. At birth, they're so small they're the size of honeybees. One litter usually consists of 20 babies, however only a few survive. The babies crawl into their mother's pouch and stay there until they're fully developed. After 67 days, they can leave the pouch for the first time. After 75 days, they're ready to eat solid food. While they're young, their mothers carry them on their back during hunts. Possums can live up to two years in the wild and four years in captivity though I wouldn't recommend them as a house pet. Is there any interesting fact about possums that you learned today? Or a fact that maybe we missed? Let us know in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is 
the pimiento. The pimiento or pimento or cherry pepper is a variety of large red heart shaped chili peppers that measure about 3 to 4 inches long and 2 to 3 inches wide. Pimientos are green when immature and then turn red when they reach full maturity. The flesh of the pimiento is sweet, succulent, and more aromatic than that of the red bell pepper. Some varieties of pimientos type are hot, including the flor gem and the Santa Fe Grande varieties. The fruits are typically used fresh or pickled. The pimiento has one of the lowest Scoville scale ratings of any chili pepper. The pimiento or, or the pimento peppers are the familiar orange stuffing found in Spanish or Greek green olives. Originally the pimento was hand washed, cut into tiny pieces, and then hand stuffed into each olive to balance out the olive's otherwise strong salty flavor. Despite the popularity of the combination, this production method was very costly and time intensive. In the industrial era, the cut pimento was shot by a hydraulic pump into the end of each olive, simultaneously inserting the pimento to the center and while injecting out the pit on the other end. More recently, for ease of production, pimentos are often pureed, then formed into tiny strips. With the help of natural gum, such as sodium or guar gum, this allows the olive stuffing to be mechanized, speeding the process, and lowering production costs. Pimentos are commonly used for making pimento cheese sandwiches, and it is also used for making pimento lo, a type of sandwich meat that's processed. I love pimento and cheese sandwiches. Have you ever tried that? I know that's pretty much a staple food on some of the menus you have at your homes. Have you tried it? And do you like it? Go ahead and let us know in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is contingency. It's a noun. It means a future event or circumstance which is possible but cannot be predicted with certainty. A provision for an unforeseen event or circumstance. Contingency. Our next word is a word you may have heard somewhere in today's episode. That word is antioxidant. It's a noun. It means a substance that inhabits oxidation, especially one used to counteract the deterioration of stored food products. Antioxidant. Let's take a look at the art of the day. While Black History Month is meant to celebrate one particular culture, it is an opportunity for everyone to learn, share, and take pride in the Black achievers that came before us and continue to make history. One of the best ways to do this is through art. Here are three African American artists whose art is beautiful, interesting, and meaningful. Starting with Alma Thomas. Alma Thomas is an expressionist painter who was born in 1891. Her early work was representational, but she evolved into her signature of work on the canvas that is characterized by shapes, color, rhythm, and powerful emotions. Thomas was a black woman in a field dominated by men. Furthermore, she didn't even begin to focus on painting until she was in her 60s after retiring as a school teacher. Some artists tell stories by creating images of things that we can easily recognize and understand, but abstract expressionists like Alma Thomas tell stories using shapes, color, and pattern. What makes art like this so wonderful is that everyone gets to decide for themselves what they think the picture is about. Next here we have Jacob Lawrence. Jacob Lawrence was born in 1917. And unlike Alma Thomas, he was a very young man when his painting career was at its height. He painted both historically significant moments of African American history as well as scenes from daily life of ordinary people. His painting was representational and even narrative. Some of his most famous work is images in a series such as The Great Migration, which tells the story of black Americans moving from the south to the north after World War I. While his style is representational, his work is somewhat abstract. It is 
characterized by people and faces with no specific identity or facial features, and bright primary colors in combination with deep blacks and browns. Pretty interesting. And lastly, we have Aaron Douglas. Aaron Douglas was born in 1899 and made art during the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance was a frenzy of art and culture expression that happened in Harlem, New York that produced new art, music, and literature. While the explosion of all this new art took place in the 1920s, Harlem continues to be a center of African American art and culture today. Aaron Douglas painted murals and large-scale paintings that are easily recognizable by their lush colors, wild movements, and symbolic images. He is also known for his signature use of centric circles that create an appearance of movement and light through the image. Very beautiful. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that cacti do not contain drinkable water? In fact, their fleshy innards do not contain liquid at all. It's true. Now, you may have heard that you can get water from a cactus if you were ever lost and dehydrated in the desert. Sounds like a nice survival tip to store away, right? But is it really that easy? Turns out, a cactus is not actually a spine-covered basin of fresh water. I repeat, it is not a source of fresh water. Such a plant could not last long in an arid habitat filled with thirsty animals. Water is truly a precious resource in the desert. So, in addition to their intimidating spines, most cactus species further protect their spongy flesh with acids and potent alkaloids. Yikes! These chemicals are usually too acid for most humans to tolerate and are taxing on the kidneys if ingested. The flesh of some cactus species can also cause vomiting diarrhea, and temporary paralysis. Obviously, none of which is conducted to your survival in an emergency situation if you're ever stranded in the desert. The notable exceptions to this rule are the prickly pear and one of the species of barrel cactus called the fishhook barrel. While both plants are fairly unpleasant to eat raw, they have less concentrated levels of chemicals and could give you a bit of hydration in a pinch. All of this is good to know of course assuming you're stranded in like a north american desert with with the true cacti i guess the best advice to be given here is if you're planning a trip crossing the desert be sure to bring plenty of water with you <laughs> so yeah cacti do not contain drinkable fresh water pretty interesting huh Yes, cue the credits. This means we have reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. So farewell, Discovery Learners. Teacher Liz here is saying thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Don't forget to attend the live Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Day Program's educational team. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified for all the fun here on Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day Program.